The world's largest tectonic plate is stirring, and when it moves, the entire planet feels its pulse. The Pacific Plate, vast enough to span nearly one-third of Earth's surface, grinds beneath and past its neighbours in an endless cycle of subduction, collision and strike-slip motion. In 2025 alone, a string of great earthquakes has rattled the edges of this giant slab, including an 8.8 .8 rupture in the Kuril-Kamchatka megathrust and a 7.7 .7 in Myanmar. For many geologists, these events are not isolated coincidences, but signs that the great gears of tectonics are shifting again. Which portions of the Pacific's boundary are next? Are the famously quiet fault segments quietly preparing for catastrophic failure, or is some of their strain being bled away by silent processes we cannot yet see? To begin to answer these questions, one must understand how stress accumulates and releases at plate boundaries. Along a subduction zone, the downgoing plate is forced beneath the overriding plate. Friction along the interface locks the two together. While locked, the overriding plate bends and bulges upward as the slip deficit grows. Over decades or centuries, that deformation stores elastic energy like a spring. When the fault finally fails, it releases that energy almost instantaneously. The upper plate snaps downward by meters, generating strong ground shaking and often displacing the sea floor enough to spawn a tsunami. This is why subduction zones produce the largest earthquakes on the planet, far surpassing anything seen on continental faults. These systems can rupture hundreds of kilometers of fault at once with tens of meters of slip. Yet because their recurrence intervals are long, centuries can pass in apparent quiet before the next great release. This is precisely what worries scientists about the world's overdue zones. Some of the most dangerous are sitting on the Pacific Plate's perimeter. One of them is the Cascadia subduction zone off the Pacific Northwest. There, the Juan de Fuca plate slides beneath North America at only a few centimeters per year, but the locked portion extends for hundreds of kilometers offshore. The last full margin rupture of about magnitude 9 struck in January of 1700, leaving drowned forests and sand sheets as silent witnesses. Based on paleo-seismic records, Great Cascadia earthquakes recur roughly every four to six centuries, sometimes sooner in partial segments. More than 300 years have already passed. Modern GPS and seafloor geodesy show that the shallow and mid-depth parts of the fault are strongly locked, while deeper transitional zones experience episodic tremor and slow slip about every 14 to 15 months. These deeper slow events relieve some stress but do little to release the stored strain in the upper fault that generates tsunamis. Computer models predict that when Cascadia finally breaks, coastal subsidence of several feet on the order of two meters could occur in minutes, greatly amplifying tsunami flooding. Across the Pacific, another giant is the Nankai Trough off southwest Japan. Here, the Philippine Sea Plate dives beneath Honshu and Shikoku. Historical records stretching back centuries show a pattern of magnitude eight-class earthquakes occurring roughly every 100 to 150 years in various segments, sometimes rupturing together to produce even larger events. Some parts of the trough have already passed their expected recurrence intervals. However, Nankai also displays one of the most intriguing complications in earthquake science, shallow, slow-slip events. In some sections near the trench, Seafloor instruments have detected months-long silent slips and tremors. These may partially relieve strain or may transfer stress to adjacent locked patches, altering the timing and size of future ruptures. The presence of fluids, the roughness of the subducting slab, and the mix of sediments all modulate frictional properties and therefore whether the plate interface creeps or locks. For hazard assessment, this makes Nankai a paradox. Some strain may be bleeding off, but large locked patches remain capable of catastrophic failure, and the shallowest portions, which control tsunami height, may still be poised to snap. Further south, the Chilean margin is another place where tectonic history suggests vulnerability. The Nazca Plate plunges beneath South America, and different segments have characteristic intervals between magnitude 8 or greater quakes on the order of 75 to 150 years. Some patches ruptured recently, such as Maul in 2010, but adjacent segments have not and may be accumulating slip deficit quietly. In the Indian Ocean, the memory of the 2004 Sumatra-Andaman magnitude 9 event 
looms large. While that enormous rupture and its aftershock in 2005 released a thousand kilometres of fault, parts of the interface remain unbroken. As the Indo-Australian plate continues to converge with the Sunda block, stress builds in these gaps and future shocks are inevitable, though their timing remains unknown. In the Himalayas, in Myanmar, and along other continental strike-slip systems, similar quiet gaps can hide decades of accumulated strain, as the unexpected 7.7 .7 sargaing rupture demonstrated in 2025. The technical basis for calling a fault overdue is not casual. Geoscientists combine geodetic measurements, seismicity patterns, and paleoseismic evidence to estimate slip deficits. High coupling indicates that the plate interface is moving far less than the relative plate motion rate, implying strong locking and strain accumulation. Seismic gaps, stretches with little background seismicity between active patches, may mark the most strongly locked asperities. But nature adds complications. Some stress can be released aseismically through slow-slip tremor or very low-frequency earthquakes. These phenomena transfer stress unevenly and sometimes trigger nearby patches rather than relax them. Fault interfaces are heterogeneous mosaics of stronger and weaker regions. When one asperity fails, it can cascade into its neighbors, producing a linked rupture far larger than expected. This explains why subduction megathrusts sometimes break hundreds of kilometers in one go. Fluid pressure within the fault zone also plays a critical role. High pore pressure reduces effective normal stress, weakening friction and encouraging slow slip or sudden failure depending on circumstances. Seamounts, roughness and sediment composition of the subducting plate further modulate how strain accumulates and releases. Thus, although scientists can identify zones of high potential, the exact timing and size of the next rupture remain inherently uncertain. Large earthquakes also redistribute stress to surrounding crust. Coulomb stress changes after a major shock can nudge adjacent faults closer to failure or sometimes delay them. This means that the cluster of magnitude 7 and above quakes around the Pacific in 2025 could in principle be transferring stress onto still-locked segments, subtly altering their countdown to failure. Whether that countdown accelerates or decelerates depends on the geometry and frictional state of each fault. In some historical sequences, a great quake was followed within months or years by another on a neighboring segment. In others, the stress changes postponed activity. Nevertheless, when multiple lines of evidence converge, long quiescence on a historically active fault, strong geodetic locking, absence of significant slow slip to relieve strain, experts grow increasingly concerned. Cascadia fits this description, as do parts of Nankai, some Chilean segments, and several other portions of the Pacific Ring. Each is a place where a large slip deficit and a quiet seismic record combine to paint a picture of potential energy waiting to be unleashed. When it will be released and how big the event will be are still questions without precise answers. The lesson from the 2025 earthquakes is sobering. The Kamchatka rupture was expected by some statistical models, but its exact timing was not predicted. The Myanmar Sagaing event struck a segment long identified as a gap but had been tranquil for decades. The pattern underscores both our improved ability to identify high-risk segments and our continued inability to forecast exact events. It also highlights the complexity of stress interactions. After the Kamchatka shock, forecasters issued high probabilities for further large aftershocks on adjacent locked patches. Similar concerns now ripple along other Pacific edges. While seismologists race to understand these processes, the monitoring network is expanding. Hundreds of seafloor observatories and GPS stations now dot subduction margins worldwide. They detect millimetre-scale motions, episodic tremor, and subtle deformation that reveal how the crust is straining. Borehole instruments measure fluid pressure and temperature deep within the fault zone. Supercomputers model the non-linear rupture dynamics and stress transfer patterns, seeking patterns that could foreshadow failure. These efforts are beginning to show how some overdue faults slip silently and how others store strain until a massive quake. Yet even with this technology, the Pacific Plate remains a restless and unpredictable force. Its edges host the fastest moving subduction zones and strike-slip faults on Earth, with convergence rates up to 10 centimetres per year. 
Around 90% of the planet's earthquakes occur in its surrounding ring of fire. That ring is not a smooth circle, but a jagged chain of arcs, trenches and transforms, each with its own stress state. The current spate of large earthquakes may or may not be a prelude to a magnitude 9 event, but it does remind us that tectonic energy is never at rest. The quiet segments are not necessarily safe. They may be the ones holding back the greatest potential. As geophysicists process the torrents of new data from recent earthquakes, they are revising some of their most basic assumptions. One of the most important shifts has been the realization that giant ruptures may not be purely periodic, but can occur in clusters separated by centuries of quiet. Instead of a neat metronome, the seismic cycle looks more like a complex heartbeat with irregular spikes. In some regions, this can mean that an area is primed for a very large event much sooner than expected, especially if a neighboring segment has just slipped and transferred stress. Computer simulations run on high-performance clusters now allow scientists to model entire plate boundary systems with realistic fault friction, fluid pressures, and seafloor topography. These models show that even small changes in stress can determine whether a rupture stops at a segment boundary or leaps across it to create a much larger quake. One example that has riveted the hazard community is the way the 2004 Sumatra Andaman earthquake altered stress in the Sunda megathrust. Its aftershocks and slow slip episodes migrated north and south over several years, and some regions that were thought to have been unloaded actually began accumulating stress faster. A similar dynamic could now be playing out around the Pacific Plate. The large Kamchatka and Myanmar quakes of 2025 each changed the stress field on their respective neighbours. If those neighbours are already strongly locked, even a small increment of additional stress can accelerate the clock to failure. This is why the timing of great earthquakes is so difficult to forecast, yet why their probabilities can jump after a major event. Another crucial development is the emergence of dense seafloor geodesy networks. For decades, scientists had only land-based GPS to infer offshore strain, but most of the locked fault area lies beneath the sea. Today, arrays of acoustic transponders anchored to the seabed measure horizontal and vertical motion of the sea floor with centimeter precision. In the Nankai Trough, these arrays have already documented subtle pre-slip phenomena weeks before moderate earthquakes. In Cascadia, new instruments placed on the continental slope record slow creep and episodic tremor that never reaches the land stations. These data feed directly into real-time hazard models. Combined with high-resolution seismic imaging of the plate interface and borehole observatories measuring pore fluid pressure, scientists are starting to see the full anatomy of a megathrust. Despite these advances, the Pacific Plate's boundaries remain inherently unpredictable because of their enormous scale and heterogeneity. A locked asperity may store hundreds of years of strain and then rupture in minutes with tens of meters of slip. The resulting displacement of seawater produces tsunamis that cross ocean basins. A magnitude 9 Cascadia earthquake would send a wall of water racing across the Pacific in hours, while Japan's densely instrumented coast might experience damaging, shaking, and secondary tsunami within minutes. In the Nankai Trough, modeling shows that simultaneous rupture of multiple segments could generate coastal subsidence of more than 2 meters and tsunami heights exceeding 10 meters in some bays. Chile's unbroken segments could produce similar waves directed across the South Pacific toward Polynesia and New Zealand. These scenarios are not speculation, but the logical extrapolation of slip deficits, convergence rates, and fault lengths. Preparing for such events requires not only scientific modeling, but also public policy, early warning, and infrastructure resilience. Japan's nationwide early warning system already detects the first seconds of a large quake and issues alerts before the strongest shaking arrives. The United States and Canada are expanding a similar system called Shake Alert along the Cascadia margin. Chile, Indonesia and other countries on the Ring of Fire are also building out networks of sensors and sirens. Yet early warning only buys tens of seconds to a few minutes. True safety depends on codes that assume the worst-case shaking and on evacuation routes for coastal communities.
For countries without robust infrastructure or where rapid urban growth has outpaced planning, a future megathrust earthquake could be catastrophic. Another dimension of these great earthquakes is their impact on global systems. A rupture of magnitude, nine or greater, releases energy equivalent to several hundred million tons of TNT and redistributes mass in the Earth's crust. This can subtly alter the planet's rotation, shift the position of the poles by centimetres and change local sea level for years. The cascading effects on harbours, ports, supply chains and energy infrastructure can ripple far beyond the immediate disaster zone. In a world already stressed by climate extremes, pandemics and economic volatility, a single very large Pacific event could have knock-on consequences across the globe. For scientists, these looming possibilities drive an urgent push to integrate seismic, geodetic and oceanographic data into unified hazard forecasts. They are testing machine learning algorithms that scan continuous waveforms for foreshock patterns or subtle signals of impending slip. They are experimenting with deploying swarms of inexpensive ocean bottom sensors to close the data gaps. They are drilling deep into the plate interface to recover cores that reveal its frictional properties. Each of these steps brings us closer to understanding when and how the planet's largest plate will next unleash its stored energy. For the public, the message is both sobering and empowering. We cannot stop the tectonic forces that drive earthquakes, but we can understand them well enough to reduce risk. The current cluster of Pacific quakes is a reminder, not a prophecy, but it is a reminder we should heed. The quiet zones around the Pacific Rim, Cascadia, parts of Nankai, unruptured Chilean segments, and several other subduction interfaces are not necessarily dormant. They may be the most dangerous precisely because they have been silent for so long. By investing in science, early warning, resilient infrastructure and community preparedness now, societies can transform inevitable geological events into manageable emergencies rather than unthinkable catastrophes. If this deep dive into the Pacific Plate and its restless boundaries has helped you see the stakes more clearly, do your part to spread awareness. Like, share and subscribe to this channel so you never miss critical updates on the science behind the planet's most powerful forces and tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience. Together, informed and prepared, we can face the next great quake with knowledge instead of surprise.